Welcome everybody to the panel on the economy. My name is Dr. Colin Murphy. I am Deputy Director here at the Myland Institute and I'm also a lecturer in British politics. I'm really delighted you can join us. One of the, the previous panel had an excellent question about what is structural reform? And I think hopefully we'll get to the bottom of that over the course of our discussion. So this panel will explore how a centre-left government could achieve structural economic reforms while also maintaining macroeconomic credibility. It will consider productivity, it will consider general principles of the economy. I think this is a particularly topical discussion topic right now. Uh, we have short-term disruption in the gilt markets, we have mutterings and disputes over long-term industrial policy within the Labour Party, so I think this should be a really informative and revelatory discussion. So the way this is going to work is I'm going to introduce each of the panellists in turn. They will speak for 10 minutes each, and then we'll just go to a wider discussion and hopefully have as uh, detailed a discussion as possible. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, and we're absolutely delighted to be joined by Seema Malhotra, MP. Seema is the Labour and Cooperative MP for Feltham and Heston in West London, and has been Shadow Minister for Business and Consumer since April 2021, I think. I think so. Um, and Seema also chairs the all-party parliamentary group on entrepreneurship and is the founder and president of the Fabian Women's Network. So we do have another Fabian in the room to speak to a previous point. Over to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colm. Look, it's fabulous to be able to, to join you today. And I did get the tail end of the first discussion. I do want to pick up on some of the points that, was, that were made. And I hope give some outline of our thinking in relation to how we're going to need to govern in uncertain economic times. Navigating economic uncertainty is therefore the way I'm wanting to frame a bit more of the, uh, the contribution, opening contribution today. And to talk a bit about the levers that Labour will need to use to strengthen our economy and to restore the stability that we need to uh, bring long-term investment. Now, I want to start with this because Labour's mission, central mission, is going to have to be economic growth. There was some discussion about whether we'll be able to reach uh, the target of being the fastest growing in the G7. We have been there before in not the most uh, recent past. But this is important because my starting point is also the sense of optimism about what Britain can become, about the, uh, the ingredients that we have across the country that I see so often when I go out. You know, it feels like we've got all the pieces of the jigsaw, but we just don't have a plan for how it all comes together. And there is really huge inefficiency in how uh, in industry has to make decisions for how to invest, the guesswork about what's going to come next and how to plan, and the general sense that they've got a government that has become very detached from how industry is working, how public services are working, and as a result, the feeling that um, the economy is broken and that our public services are broken. Now, our weakened infrastructure is highlighted just this week by, our, by some export figures that have come out. And UK exports in the last decade were worse than any G7 country except Japan. And that's according to UN figures. Now, this tallies with something that I was told about a month ago by a local business, where their products that they manufacture and export from the UK, it used to be three days before products were sent from the UK were on the shelves in Germany. Now they tell me it's 30 days. And they aren't the only ones to give me that sort of story. And so we have to be clear that Labour is going to inherit an economy with sclerotic growth, with long-term underinvestment, with flatlining wages, with a failing housing market, with public services on their knees. And we're going to need to have a plan for growth that is serious about how we're also going to work in partnership to deliver it. Now, when I say work in partnership, that means two things. It means 
what the role of the state is going to need to be and how we're going to work with industry and with universities and with the country on how we deliver a plan for growth. That's why when we talk about a mission-led government and you've had some discussion of the, the five missions and how they should be interpreted, but look, I think let's talk loosely about a broad mission um, to have economic growth with all the enablers that you're going to need in order to deliver that. A key part of that is going to be how we work with business and industry. And I say that partly as a shadow minister for business, uh, but also because um, there's no government that's going to achieve its goals without working with business. The reason why is that 82% of our country's workforce are employed in the private sector. And we don't sometimes say it in those terms um, when we have uh, conferences on the left, but it is true. And um, the private sector is... Um, is for, you know that from small businesses all the way to large. I grew up above our family small business in our community. There is six, almost six million small businesses across our country. Those who are so many of them labour supporters. Those who are at the bedrock of our communities. They are the places you get your hair cut. They are the places, you know, your you know kids might buy their sweets. They are the places you get your newspaper. They are you know they are those that are the the bedrock of our communities. They are also those that are the new tech innovators, um, growing some of the new technology um, uh, startups. Um, they are the people who are in our supply chains. So when we talk about big industry, when we talk about steel, as we uh, had an announcement about last week, or we talk about an airport like that's near to me in, in Heston, what you don't talk about um, are all those in the supply chains across the country and the people that are employed in those. And part of what we've got to do is think about an economy that is building a role for the centre. This isn't just about the Treasury. It is about how the Treasury is going to be working uh, with um, new devolution settlements. It's how the Treasury is working with uh, the, the, the business team and our, our, um, all, of our, uh, all of our departments, our skills teams, because all of that and how Labour works together across those silos in government and what we're planning for now is part of how we're going to deliver economic growth. And that requires us to take really seriously a plan for stability that commands national and international confidence. And that will give confidence that Britain is a stable place to invest. I've had too many conversations of people saying that we might be saying one thing um, to, you know, to an audience or um, in, in Britain or Keir giving a speech or Rachel giving a speech. But the question is what people abroad are hearing, people who are influencing decisions um, about where and what to invest in. Uh, and this isn't just small amounts of investment. This is billions of billions of investment. They're choosing between you know, um, Joe Biden's um, Inflation Reduction Act or what the EU might do, or should they trust Britain? Because Britain, frankly, hasn't been the best advert for stable government uh, in, in recent times. And look, this is the last, you know, the last, um, uh, particularly the last four or five years uh, in terms of how the, the government's handled Brexit and what the impact it has had on confidence and, and people's perceptions of Britain. It's been accelerated in terms of that lack of confidence over the last year. That disastrous um, uh, um, uh, few weeks weeks that we had with Liz Trust was significant in terms of how it weakened trust uh, in, uh, and weakened and sidelined our economic institutions, whether it was the Bank of England uh, or it was the OBR. And that had impact way beyond Westminster. So part of what we're doing and how we need to build, um, rebuild trust in our institutions is part of how we build re a rebuild trust in government. So the way in which we've outlined our industrial strategy, um, uh, has been really important and significant in this because that has been about saying there's a long-term plan for how we want to rebuild our country's economy and rebuild it in a way that's going to see prosperity being shared across the country. We cannot have um, a permission from the country for the choices we want to make without people across the country feeling that they're going to be part of how our country's prosperity is developed, um, how it is then shared. Because a Tory, que a Tory question for prosperity 
prosperity that looks um, in, you know, in stark terms about how the wealthiest will get wealthier and then looks to that to say the country's improving in its wealth is ignoring the fact that we are seeing the widening gaps between the rich and the poor and without a, a, a pathway in which those who have been excluded from growth will see a pathway into that growth. So I'll just end by saying there are sort of two, two broad points. The first is stable and competent political leadership with competent stewardship of the economy that restores some of that macroeconomic stability and credibility that strengthens our institutions and ends the turmoil and gives people confidence that we're ending the turmoil that we saw in September. How you do politics and how you govern really, really matters. And the second is that strong industrial policy framework because it's going to need to have a, a long-term plan that businesses and uh, industry uh, has confidence to invest in, but also our local government, where local government increasingly are the drivers of local economic development plans, are going to have confidence for how they should uh, guide investment into their local economies. And some of the consequences and also the opportunities in a post-Brexit climate, for example, the Subsidy Control Act, where we're going to see state aid effectively be able to be delivered through uh, local councils being able to invest alongside um, uh, industry, how we're going to have a national wealth fund, which is a game changer in my view for how the country invests and how the taxpayer gets returned for those investments. And how, if I'll just mention about the green industrial, uh, green prosperity plan, I think I think there's a temptation to sort of say it's a one or the other, and it's an you know it's either 28 billion on day one or it's nothing at all, which is utterly ridiculous. You know we're going to need to ramp up to um, you know to, to that 28 billion, which was part of some of the IPPR's work as well in terms of long-term thinking about our economy. But it is a plan that's going to that is basically saying if we're going to see some of the transitions for some of the structural change we need in our economy, uh, seeing an end to some of, um, uh, you know, over decades it will be, but oil and gas transitioning into green energy, um, seeing a green, um, our sprint becoming a green energy superpower by 2030, you're going to need to have a skills plan that underpins that, you're going to need to have a public services plan that ends uh, waiting times because too many people are out of work because they, the 7 million, you know, are on a waiting uh, treatment. I've seen that in my um, uh, constituency as well people can't work because they're you know they're too sick all of those things have to tie into how we're going to have a plan for economic growth that's going to be underpinned by strong public services and a strong public realm and so I'll end it there um, uh, with my opening remarks thank you very much Wonderful, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I'll go straight to our second speaker. We're also delighted to be joined by Professor Diane Coyle. Uh, Diane is Professor of Public Policy at the University of Cambridge and co-director of the Bennett Institute for Public Policy. Uh, she heads the Institute's research under the themes of progress and productivity, which I believe is going to be a particular theme of her remarks today, and was awarded a CBE in 2018 for her con contribution to the public understanding of economics. Cogs and Monsters, which I think is her latest book explores how economics can keep pace with the 21st century and the digital economy. Over to you. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do, do shout at the back if you can't hear. Um, so I agree with Seema that the economy is broken and we're in a downward spiral and you can see it in all kinds of ways. For example, we've got a food system that makes people unwell and harms the environment. We've got a finance system that where the firms profit at the expense of their customers and bring us to the edge of systemic fragility from time to time. We've got a housing market that means that most people can't afford places to live. But you know, as I'm an economist and speak in terms that are the opposite extreme from lyric poetry, <laughs> I thought I'd talk about productivity, which is one of those economic terms that nobody uses in normal life. But it's a really simple and important concept. It's about what do we get out in terms of living standards from what we put in. And productivity in the UK, and therefore living standards, has been flatlining since the mid-2000s. Um, the IFS said the other day, it's the longest period of no growth in living standards since the Napoleonic Wars. So many countries have slowed down in terms of their productivity growth. It's worse here than elsewhere. And with the OBR forecasting flat living standards for the next 10 years or so, this is an unsustainable position. And I think the only question is, in what way does it become sustainable? Do we implement policies that change the way that the economy is going, 
or do we just jump from crisis to crisis and cope with it as best we can? Now, economists think about productivity in terms of what do businesses do or public, service, pu public services? What do you put in and what do you get out? And what you put in is capital, labor, energy, and materials. In terms of energy and materials, the economy has actually become massively more productive over the past 40 years. So the worry is about how do we use capital and labor? And often it's about it investing in new technologies and we know that investment has been very weak. People talk about it often as, you know, people have got to work harder. And it's not at all that. If you think about a construction site, somebody's going to be more productive if they've got a mechanical digger than if they've got a spade. So the investment matters a lot. Um, and it needs to augment human labor so that over time it delivers better jobs, um, uses um, skills, and pays people um, higher wages. So what is it that's gone wrong? And there are lots of things. And as Seema said, we know a lot of the ingredients. Um, it's skills including not only educational outcomes, but health. Poetically, economists call this human capital. Human capital hasn't been growing fast enough. There's long, a lot of long-term sickness in the economy, and worse here than elsewhere. Um, it's uh, capital investment by private firms, but also public infrastructure. Our public infrastructure is in a shocking state. And it's innovations and investment. We have a fantastic research system. We have a lot of entrepreneurs. We have um, a perpetual problem in getting large-scale investment into that, so that scales up into goods and services that people will buy and that we can export. So that's a long-standing list. Some of it goes back to the 1930s or earlier. So why has nothing changed? And it's about the recipe. Um, and I've been pondering this for a long time. I'm a researcher in the Productivity Institute, which is a big investment based in Manchester with lots of universities taking part. And I think part of the issue is that we always think about productivity as being a matter of individual choices and the uncertainties that people face in the environment in which they make those choices. Is the business going to buy a 3D printer? Is it going to start to use generative AI? Um, are people going to choose healthy food or get more exercise? And I think the bit that we've missed is that productivity is actually a collective phenomenon. It's how do we organize our society to make the best use of the available resources using ideas and ways of doing things differently. Now, the private sector is absolutely fundamental to that. It employs people. Um, it's going to drive innovation largely. But it requires um, public investment as well, because the market and the state are complements. They're not, not opposites. And we spent 40 years talking about them as if they're the opposites. So I think this government has chosen the right sectors in terms of innovation. It's, um, uh, AI, it's uh, green technologies, it's the creative industries, they're all UK strengths, we should absolutely build on those. So I would focus really on the dysfunctions of policy making in this country. It's completely inconsistent. Um, one of uh, my colleagues and I just published a paper that looks at policy announcements during Boris Johnson, Johnson's uh, prime ministership and Subsequent policy documents made almost no reference at all to the two strategy documents published at the start of that period. And of course, the industrial strategy was abolished. Um, but it's, it goes back beyond uh, the Johnson premiership. It goes back beyond the conservative government. Increasingly, we have seen government by announceables, uh, things that you want to get into the media grid and be able to say, look at what marvelous things we're doing. So I think it does go to the discussion about communication in the, in the previous um, uh, panel. But there are also um, incoherences across departments which don't coordinate with each other on these um, multifaceted challenges that we're facing, and between different levels of government, between the national and uh, the local, the insane boundaries for local economic governance that we have that are completely um, overlapping or underlapping, and alongside that, the lack of devolution of powers. I, it is just incomprehensible to me that further education policy is set down the road um, when the knowledge about skill needs in local economies is incredibly specific. So it isn't just that we need people to get degrees in or, or qualifications in ele uh, electronics. We need specific kinds of electronics depending on what the local industrial base is. Um, so you, you can't build a sound economic edifice without the scaffolding, and the public sector is the scaffolding. 
We've got a disintegrating political realm, I would say, and also a public realm. So industrial policy is great. I like to call it industrial strategy because for me, it isn't the stability, it's the strategy. It's the long-term strategic thinking that is core. And we have been absolutely terrible about that. I'm a little bit cautious about saying, let's spray state aid everywhere because competition is really important for this process as well. So there will be some bets to be made, but a lot more of it is about a stable economic framework, thinking about technical standards, thinking about advanced market guarantees that worked so well during um, the procurement of vaccines, thinking about using public procurement intelligently to get innovation, thinking about skills and who should be making what decisions about investment and skills. Um, industrial policy has come back into fashion in a way I've not seen in economics since the 1970s, which is definitely a good thing. And the EU and the US are um, ramping up their industrial policies. A lot of other economies in Asia never stopped having industrial policies. If you're the only country not playing the industrial policy game, you're going to lose the game. So we've definitely got to do it. Um, we've got to think about public investment at scale and ramping it up is fine because that has multiplier effects and it stimulates private investment too. Um, but that, that, the bottom line for me is about consistency. And so that means it's not just a Labour Party debate, it's a much broader debate, and I guess I would call it a centre-centre debate as much as anything. Thank you. Wonderful, and now we can move on to our final speaker, uh, Dr. Jeevan Santa. Uh, Jeevan is an economist and also the Labour Party's prospective parliamentary candidate for Loughborough, so I, I'm sure he's very, very busy at the moment. Um, he is an expert in the political and economic causes of income inequality and poverty in the United Kingdom and its impact on well-being. And before his selection, Jeevan worked at the Somaliland Ministry of Finance, the Treasury, and was head of economics at the New Economics Foundation. Over to you. And the first thing to say is, for a future Labour government, where we're going to sit, it's likely that we will have the worst inheritance in this country since 1945. We have seen the foundations of our prosperity have been shattered and indeed decimated over the past 13 years through incompetence. And indeed, in 1945, they saw those foundations shattered by war. That is the situation which we face. And beyond that as well, technological and global forces have made it harder for all of us to share in growing prosperity, in people and in places. The truth is, the fundamental truth is about economics. There is no law, no economic principle that says just because you work hard and you do the right thing, you will earn a decent living, either as a place or as an individual. You can do your best and have two jobs. It doesn't mean you're going to earn enough to put food on the table. And a future Labour government will need to address that both the long-term forces that have led it to make it harder to earn enough to basically put food on the table and live a decent life, as well as pick up the pieces after the last 13 years. That's what they will have to do. And really myself, in terms of where I sit, look, I'm a socialist in the, in the cross-sodite mold. I believe we should be creating a country in which everybody can thrive, where the ends matter more than the means. And to do that, it will take public and private investment. It will also take on both our domestic and our global economic challenges. Domestically, we have seen, like every other high-income nation across the world, a huge divide grow up because of technological change and trade. And broadly speaking, you know, in the night after 1945, in those 30 years, we saw people and places grow and share in that growth equally. Manufacturing plants across the country. People, and yes, it was also, to be true, mostly men, would leave school, get a good job, be able to earn a decent living. That began to change in the 1980s across, across the developed world. What we saw was technological change destroyed those mid-pay manufacturing jobs, and what it left us with was high-pay graduate jobs, mostly in major cities, and low-pay jobs, everybody else. And that divide grew up between people and between places, high and low pay on the both sides. And that's the kind of like, economic geography that we have faced, and indeed, the new Labour government faced in 1997, where it kind of said, OK, we have those, we'll start to redistribute and throw a bit more, if you like, investment around. It's clear the challenge today is much greater. The second challenge that we face is the fact that, yes, the domestic foundations of our prosperity have been decimated 
over the past 13 years. We're the only country in the OECD where after initial pandemic shock, more people were leaving the labor force due to sickness. And that is because of the issues that we all know about. The fact that you can't get a GP appointment when you call at 8 a.m. in the morning. The fact that NHS waiting lists are over 7 million. I know of people who have died waiting for ambulances when they call 999. If you can't get a doctor today, that makes you sicker tomorrow. It means we're producing less in the future. And that's only set to get worse before, of course, hopefully a Labour government comes in in the next year. Beyond that as well, we know that wages have stalled. We know that we are now in a position where our wages are lower than they were in 2005. It's unprecedented, the amount of crisis. And it is indeed a crisis of living standards, people being unable to earn enough. And beyond that, you know, the lists do go on and on. We could talk about Shore Start, for example, and the fact that children today are less prepared for school than they were in the middle of this decade. And when children, by the way, in their earliest years are, are learning less, they're earning less tomorrow as well. We have to deal with that entire gamut. And of course, that goes beyond the rest of it as well, infrastructure and the like. There is a lot left to fix, and a lot of damage that has been done over the past decade. And finally, and thirdly, of course, which is incredibly important, is getting to net zero. There is no prosperity unless we stop emitting carbon. A burning planet is really bad for business. We cannot safeguard our future if we do not stop, indeed, get to that net zero economy. And to do that, the investment profile, I mean, those investments you like have to happy, happen as early as possible. And Seema's entirely right, by the way. There was no kind of, a Labour government will not be able to walk in throw 28 billion pounds around and see wind farms pop out of the ground. Like those plans will need to be put forward. You know, they will need to be prepared. And it is though for us to do and also fundamentally get that spending as early as possible. We have to make the investments in this decade to get to net zero by 2050. We make the investments now in better energy, for example, we have lower bills in the future. This is a pounds and pence issue, right? It's a pounds and pence issue in investing in lower bills and higher wages of the future. And getting net zero, by the way, isn't just, of course, about the economics. Last year, we saw heat waves of over 40 degrees Celsius. When temperatures didn't get that high, people die. Over 3,000 pensioners died last year in that heat wave. We have to secure both our prosperity and our health by investing in net zero today. And those are domestic challenges we face. Globally as well, of course, we face huge challenges, economic challenges. And one thing I think that we speak about less is what is our place in the world or international economic relationships. The first thing is that, of course, our trading relationships have become more difficult since 2016. And there is really about when you speak to businesses, they say, this is the new world, but there is no stability. Exporters in this country, exporters generally are the most productive, less than 10% of businesses export. They're the ones that have to do invest the most, have to plan for the future. If they don't know what the rules are going to be tomorrow, they won't make those investments today. It's a huge reason why since 2016 we've had that flatlining investment. It's been chaos. It was chaos with Johnson, it was chaos with Trust, and now no one really knows where Sunak is sitting either. And if businesses don't know, they're not going to invest. And if they don't invest, our wages don't grow. Secondly as well, when it comes to kind of thinking about where we're seeing, especially with climate change, we import more carbon emissions than we produce here at home in the goods that we consume. So it's no good just saying, by the way, yes, we've come to clean energy at home if we're not also thinking about the rest of the world. This is a global problem, right? We reduce our carbon emissions, but we haven't seen them reduce elsewhere. We are still going to pay the price for that. And thirdly as well, we do have across the globe clearly a rising authoritarian Block. The idea of the end of the 1990s that we have the end of history is now clearly very much over. And a huge part of that, of course, is the fact that indeed people didn't share in prosperity after technological change and trade. It's not a coincidence that the populist movements of both Brexit and Trump were born in the former industrial areas of both countries. The Rust Belt in the United States and indeed where I'm around from the Midlands and the north and south of the United Kingdom. And in that world where democracy is more under threat, Securing our key imports is no longer about the libertarian free trade kind of utopia that was envisaged maybe a decade or two decades ago. It is active for us to think about how we are going to secure the future inputs. So the issues that we face, and I think they are quite large, but of course, as a, as a future Labour government, and indeed, uh, we've seen that programme put out and how we're dealing and plan to deal with those challenges. The first of which is, is the Green Prosperity Plan, indeed the decentralisation 
that comes with it. That is about getting to net zero. It is about investing in industries that get wages rising, but particular as well, those non-graduate jobs that will exist outside of major cities, those areas that were locked out of economic growth and prosperity in the past. And indeed, if we want to see kind of the blueprint for that, we're seeing it at the moment in the United States, factory building skyrocketing at this point in time and investment direct into the into red states as well. This is something we can do, something that we will do in government. The second real issue that we have is clearly around public investment. We know that the foundations, the prosperity of shafts, we know the NHS is not working. We know that school buildings are crumbling. We know unless we do that, unless we invest in those foundations again, we will not have economic growth. You know, businesses, fundamentally those in the private sector, do need skills. They also need, by the way, roads that don't aren't littered indeed with potholes. Those are all the things that we have to do when we get back in to government. And thirdly, of course, net zero. And that doesn't just mean about addressing it at home, which of course we will do, but also using that as an opportunity to invest abroad and help other nations lower their carbon emissions. If we're thinking about our place in the world, what we are doing to help get to net zero is also an opportunity for us abroad. And for us as a country that exports mostly services, clearly the expertise that we all have will be absolutely crucial in doing that. And I'll close with saying that, that this has been an incredibly difficult couple of years. And there is a sense in which when you speak to people on the doorstep, as of course I do, and indeed SEMA does, and every single Labour politician, a sense of apathy and to some extent despair as well. Like things cannot get better, that we are stuck on this path of decline and stagnation. The truth is, it is for us to kind of take that on. I am hopeful for the future. I'm hopeful for what we can achieve. I'm hopeful to go on and take that on. It is for us to say, actually, let us go build that country where every single person can thrive, to do so both with public and private investment, thinking about what we're doing at home and abroad. And that change that we seek, that country where everyone could thrive, it's not granted to us by right, but it's earned through graft. That's for us to earn, indeed for us to think about. Thank you very much. Fantastic. And we have about 20 minutes for questions. So I'm going to deploy Chair's privilege, apologies, and ask a couple of questions to, well, a question for each of you, I think. And then I'll throw open and make sure we get a good discussion going. Um, so firstly, I wondered if I could ask Seema, but also Diane, about the everyday economy concept that Rachel Reeves uh, was using a lot a few years ago. Maybe less so now, but it's still very much in, in the... Uh, discussion seem that a lot of what you talked about you know the, the the private sector of our daily lives people going get going to the barbers going to the hairdressers that is the everyday economy is there a risk that a labor government which will be doing all these very important industrial strategies and investment strategies those tend to focus on high value parts of the economy and exporting parts of the economy which don't necessarily overlap very much with the everyday economy at least in large parts of the country so how do you balance those two priorities um, Diane, in the previous panel, Nick Pierce said, you don't need to become a German economy to have a long-term, a long-termist industrial policy. Now, if you read center-left thinking on industrial strategy for the last de few decades, they tend to say, become Germany or Japan. I'm simplifying, but they do. Do you agree? And if so, how, what institutional reforms are needed aside from devolution in a liberal market economy? Is it relationship with finance? Is it relationship with the labor markets? What kind of structural reforms are needed to have that, that long-termism that has been sorely lacking in a recent government policy? And then, Jeevan, that was fantastic. Because you mentioned the global perspective, I wonder if you wanted to speak more about uh, the end of globalization as we know it, which again came up in the previous panel. Uh, there is discourses of increasing Supply chains that are more robust, friendshoring. Um, we're not using the word protectionism, but there's definitely an undercurrent here of, of taking a more strategic view of trade policy. And I wonder how a Labour government should approach the difficult issue, particularly given that the last time a British government pursued protectionism in a serious and sustained way, it was an empire in a very different global economy. So how do you do it today? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. That's a, a very helpful question because I did allude to the everyday economy without uh, drawing it out as, as, as distinctly. Let me say a few words about that. There are two big things that will make a difference. One is reducing the cost of living crisis. 
to increase the ability to spend in the local economy. The second is reducing the cost of doing business and to have a way in which you've got a plan for your everyday economy businesses, which are largely the smaller enterprises. The plans that we've outlined are absolutely trying to make um, uh, a difference there. And one of the most important things that we have said is that we want to see a reform of business rates and a change to business rates and enter them as we've known them. Because business rates are a high cost before you've even made a penny in profits. And at the same time, when we look at how our economy has changed, our business taxation system that we've currently got some review going on and we'll do more in government, our business taxation system is very much geared around the economy as it was, not as the economy is now. And that is resulting in some of the online giants particularly being able to get away with not paying anywhere near their fair share of tax, while we tax in different ways um, disproportionately those businesses that are just struggling to survive. So our plans for changing uh, the business rates, uh, reforming business taxation, uh, our plans for tackling late payments, which is a massive issue for a lot of our, our businesses, um, whether that's also your uh, local solicitor firms and others. It's an enormous cost. There's an estimate that around 50,000 businesses a year go out of business, according to the FSB, because of late payments. It isn't that they didn't do the work. It isn't that they didn't earn the income. It is that they didn't get paid and that cash flow then hits hard. So there are very different issues and we have to have a framework, a much stronger framework for how we make it easier and fairer for those who are setting up and running those smaller businesses in our communities. But in addition to that, I think our plans for skills are absolutely vital because when I go around the small businesses, whether it's in hospitality, our cafes, our restaurants, or it's our hairdressers, or it's construction and our builders, you know, th those that are the, the firms that you see every day, they are really struggling to get the workforce they need. We have had an utterly woeful way in which we have got, we've had a skills planning for the long term. So that absolutely has to be part of a plan for our everyday economy as much as it does the bigger industries and the growth industries uh, of the future. And I'll just close by saying this, part of what we're going to have to do is not just try and reinvent the wheel everywhere for the sake of it. You know, the, the Tories did that terribly when they came in. And in fact, you know, I would say that even the way they got rid of the RDAs, which really were a really good vehicle through which um, support for small businesses and communities was, was sort of delivered, they got rid of the RDAs without a plan for what to replace them with, with a sort of regional and sub-regional way in which you were having economic strategy and, uh, and working together to deliver beyond the sort of arbitrariness of local government. In my view, that was an act of economic vandalism. And we have paid the price for not having a plan for how our regions and our local economy should be developing. But what was also... Um, what is also important is that we have um, that we keep what's starting to work. So the local skills improvement plans that are a step forward, uh, catapults, um, make smarter. Some of those mechanisms that have been strong and innovative and are working, we need to keep and we need to embed them into a much better and much stronger plan for government uh, leading regional and local growth. Thank you. Briefly, briefly on the everyday economy, it's a euphemism for the low value added bits of the economy that don't export. I mean, obviously, you can't ignore it, and you, we would want to see rising productivity and improved skills and better wages and high quality jobs in, in both the technology frontier and, and, and those kinds of areas. Uh, the key thing is that I think people need to have the opportunities to get the jobs that they want um, wherever they are. And that means thinking also about things like um, commuting, bus routes into town, uh, but also what we've labelled universal basic infrastructure, some people call universal basic services. What's the minimum offer to everybody, no matter what they live in the, in the country? Um, we're looking at that at the moment, trying to be specific about it rather than abstract and comparing it to, to Germany. So we're not going to become the German economy. We've got a completely different set of strengths and industrial structure. Um, so the structural reforms needed for long-termism are you know, easy to say. It's joining up policies and being consistent in them. 
So if you take something that we are very strong in, like the creative sector, um, which is not divorced from manufacturing because it's about industrial design or um, uh, many exportables such as games and music as well, 6% of the economy, so about the same size as the finance sector, and the government just announced a, a small investment in the, in the creative industries. But they've had other policies that hammer um, the relevant subjects in universities, um, that the relevant departments don't join up across each other. Um, they've had inconsistent policies like um, defunding parts of the BBC, which is a, a fundamental investor in research and development in the creative industries. So it's thinking just more holistically about, you know, we've identified what our strengths are, what do we need to join up and stick with so that we have that healthy industrial structure? Thank you very much. In terms of the free trade thing, I mean, one thing that's been true since, I think, in the last couple of years, especially that Britannia unchanged is this was argument over evidence, right? This was all about the corn laws as if the world hadn't changed in the last 150 years. Like, that's, that's where that, that dogma has kind of got to. Like, free trade does have benefits, but it is slightly complicated. And basically, the thing that happens with free trade is this. When you lower, if you like, barriers, especially import tariffs, you end up basically... In, as a high-income UK nation actually harming kind of low-pay sectors. But the other side of it is you get gains because your prices are lower, and that's why it's generally beneficial. But then as you get closer and closer to 0%, the greater the kind of cost is on industries, the less the benefit is to individuals. So actually, even before, if you like, Brexit, our tariffs of the outside world were low, basically. They weren't very high. And so it's not worth thinking about, well, what has to get down to 0%, which is where kind of the debate has kind of got to. In terms of future trade deals, obviously you had Nick on and Nick is going to say and set out the policy. I'm not going to, you know, go in there. But what I think is important is, is that actually it's not about a, a sense of protectionism versus free trade. It's about what is the right level of tariff and what is the right level of protection. And in the terms of the, the history, I mean, Diana, I know this as well, much better certainly than I will, but South Korea and Japan, their industrial policy in the post-war era. And so there is a sense in which, you know, free trade isn't about a 0% tariff and it never really has been. And what our trading relationship will be will be one that actually does ensure that people and places do share in that growing prosperity. Great, let's have some questions, please. Okay, um, can I take uh, the person at the front first and then uh, you, Chiminda, I think, yeah? And then you in the blue shirt there, if that's okay. Thank you so much for this amazing uh, discussion. So my question is uh, more about uh, related to net zero, uh, the net zero project. So how are you going to decarbonize um, mostly heavy industries because this is the most difficult um, uh, industry to, to decarbonize and, um, and you were talking about uh, financing um, uh, renewables such as solar, wind power, what about hydrogen, uh, mainly green hydrogen? Uh, are you going to build new infrastructures or are you going to use the existing pipeline? So, um, yeah, that's mine. Put your hand up, please. Thank you. Uh, hello, yeah. Um, I've got a question for uh, Seema Malhotra. Um, you were talking uh, in your opening speech about uh, the lack of investment in the economy uh, being related to lack of stability. Um, I was wondering if and to what extent you think that there's also an issue in terms of uh, short-termism by uh, corporate leadership in sections of the economy. I mean, the obvious one, I suppose, would be in the water industry, the privatized water companies where you know, there's been a lack of investment and enormous you know, profit-taking, if you like. Um, and I was looking at a figure from the IPPR published last year where they said there was more than 40 billion pounds had been spent by FTSE 100 companies last year on share buybacks. So I was wondering yeah, if, if there's an element of kind of short-termism going on in corporate leadership and whether there's uh, a role for government in changing tax or incentives around you know, to, to kind of reduce that. Put your hand up, please. Thanks, uh, Josh Nicholson from the Centre for Social Justice. Um, just on pay levels, we spoke about that briefly and I think touched on that for many, the 
social fabric's almost fraying, that understanding that if you went out and worked, you would earn a good wage to support a family, just doesn't exist now for many people who haven't gone down the university route, and even for some graduates. I'm just wondering how you see, in the next five, ten years, a way of increasing pay for people so they can better trust that work will provide a route to success and the good life, and have we really understood the trade-offs and what that might mean? Does it mean less people going to university? Does it mean more routes into trades that maybe aren't as respected nowadays? Does it mean a less um, globalised economy? Just really appreciate your thoughts on that. Thanks. Yeah, I think in terms of, it's a very interesting question about decarbonising industries and hygiene, etc. In terms of exactly what we're we're going to do in government, I'm sure those will all be considered. I'm not going to make any spending commitments because Rachel will tell me off. Mm. Um, we're not, you know, I, I'm not going to say this is what we're going to do and there we're going to do it. I very much imagine it's going to be part of the mix. And I think the way to really think about it is to say, what is it that we need to achieve to get to net zero, decarbonising heavy industries? Okay, how are we going to get there? Right, that's been the clear direction of a Labour government, and it's what a Labour government's going to do in office. It's why we're setting out the 28 billion. It's the whole point <coughs> of the Green Prosperity Plan. That's where we're going to get to, right? And also, I think also, look, I'm an economist. I'm not um, an engineer. My understanding of it is you need hydrogen to use trucks because the batteries are too big, and actually, otherwise, you're not going to be able to move things around. The same is true of planes, but I would kind of leave it to them. And the good news on that side has always been for me solar. So the huge reductions in prices, a lot more than we were expecting. So certainly, I you know, have faith, if you like, in both the policy-making process and the technological improvements to get there. For governments, is to provide both the financing as well as the certainty of policy and where we're sitting. Uh, the second bit about securing pay and people, there's two different sides of that. The first of which is actually investing in those industries and ensuring that you are creating good jobs for those who have non-graduates, and consciously so, is clearly going to be a key part of that, right? We also have also plans, of course, to reform the apprenticeship levy. But beyond that as well, we also have something we don't really talk about as much, actually, as a party, which is the New Deal for working people, or at least we don't talk about from the economics perspective, where we're really focusing on expenditure and tax, right? And on that side, we are looking at, you know, the greatest increase in worker rights, certainly probably in my lifetime, collective agreements and collective bargaining at the sectoral level is a hugely, it'll be a huge innovation in industrial relationships. You know, I talked a bit about the division between high and low pay places and indeed people, but something else has also happened at the same time as a division in high and low pay firms. It, you know, it would previously be the case that, you know, a very kind of conglomerate firm would kind of have cleaners inside the industry and you would kind of redistribute within the company. One huge, another change that happens since the 1980s is the, is the form of outsourcing from companies. They put that outside to a cleaning company. So in one sense, you have a financial company like Morgan Stanley interacting with a cleaning company. If you have to agree with the sectoral level, you are looking at a way by to redistribute between high and low pay firms that doesn't so much depend upon the state. And that could be a huge innovation in our industrial relationships. Indeed, it's something we don't talk about enough. So those are kind of where we're going to get to. And, you know, hopefully if we win next year. I'll comment briefly on the same two. Um, I don't think heavy industry is the problem. It's already cheaper to generate through renewables than through fossil fuels. Uh, but it's transport, and there's a lot of research going on on hydrogen, but also housing and construction, which will be really difficult to decarbonize. And I'd like to see more thinking about, about that. On, on the pay levels question, this is why productivity matters. Productivity enables firms to make profits, which enables them to make, uh, pay higher wages. Uh, you've also obviously got to make them do that, so the institutions of the labour market matter, and the minimum wage has been incredibly, incredibly important. Um, but actually, I think there's a real problem in that a lot of low wages and contingent work are in the public sector or in areas that the public sector has contracted out, like hospital cleaning or like social care. So that, I mean, I'm a bit obsessed about it. That also goes back to productivity because you've got to tax the businesses which have become more productive to pay more for, um, and upskill people in, in public services too. Thanks very much. Three great questions. On decarbonising heavy industry, I'll just add a couple of thoughts. It is, uh, it is a very significant question because there are um, uh, big changes to make. And just as one example, last week, uh, 
Keir outlined our plan for steel and the steel industry. And part of the reason for that was not just because steel is a really important foundation industry. It's one of the things you want for your economic resilience, for robust um, supply chains uh, and, your, and your industrial security uh, as well. But how we produce steel needs to be needs greening, and that takes five, seven plus years. That isn't going to happen on its own. And so the way in which, you know, for those that, uh, for the plants that um, uh, need to make a green transition uh, to maybe electric arc furnaces from how, they're, 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 you know, they've got their furnaces now, that is going to require not just a multi-year plan for investment and change, but also how you're going to look at different um, skills development and how, if you've got industries that are going to be, um, to some extent, in decline, like oil and gas, you're going to have a plan for how some of those jobs are going to evolve and how you're going to have be ahead of the game on how skills are going to need to evolve. And look, we've we We've led the way in industrial revolutions before, but this is a really this is where in a world which is much much more competitive, and so what's at stake isn't just jobs in the UK, but also how our economy is going to function and, and be more resilient, particularly as uh, as as security and economic security. Um, uh, we've we've got new questions and challenges in the wake of how um, Ukraine has exposed uh, our, um, our sort of industrial weaknesses. Um, but I think um, it's important to, uh, to to also come back to this point about long term because it isn't going to happen overnight, which is why even the Green Prosperity Plan isn't an overnight plan. It's a multi-year plan um, uh, as well. And I'll just come back to this point uh, about long-termism as well because you are, you're right that there are decisions that are being made um, in, um, in the short term. And part of that has been policy failure. You know, for example, around uh, water to companies how we've allowed those sewage dumps you know without accountability the you know and 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 not worried about the number of them i mean this has been a policy failure as much as it has been about businesses not planning um for for the long term but there are areas where you know talking about um uh, reforms of um section 172 of the companies act reform of directors duties how you might look to how you've got more structural ways in which the long term um uh, work of um, and uh, investment of Companies can be um, uh, supported. You know, we've got a takeover regime that doesn't have a strong public interest test, so um, it much more exposed to um, to businesses putting in work for the long term, building resilient supply chains, having local, um, having business, small businesses across the UK supplying them, and then can be taken over and all of that work be undone because you don't have uh, ways in which you've you've got things like public interest interest test or mechanisms to um, uh, to to build in um, uh, more resilience into uh, into those uh, takeovers and mergers. So there is work to do, and th there are movements outside of the Labour Party that want to see change and that are business-led. Uh, and there the TUC putting forward ideas, other institutes putting forward ideas. What it doesn't have is a political leadership, and that is an area where Labour's very keen to... Keir's given speeches on this as well, to step into that space. And it's really, really important for um, long-term stability of investment in the ways uh, that, are, that are talked about. And finally, if I can just make a point about um, people not going to university. Look, we have not cracked this issue of having alternative pathways to prosperity that mean that we've got a really robust uh, apprenticeships framework, uh, that we've got a really good vocational education um, routes, uh, we've got that we've got really good um, and strong further education. There are steps in those directions right now, but they do not have an overall plan. And just as you know, I had an FE college say to me, should they make a million pound investment in um, some you know green training for industry, um, which will be mean that those that go in through FE routes uh, in three years' time will come out with these new qualifications. And how do they know in the lack of an industrial strategy from the government, and you're right, the government got rid of it and even just changed the name of the department so there isn't a department, the industrial strategy in the title, how do they know that that's still going to be relevant in three or four years' time? By the time they've got the facility, they've designed the courses, they've got the young people or adults through the courses, that they're going to still be the relevant skills 
in five years' time. And that lack of planning is really, at a, 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 a national level, is leading to a lack of investment because they didn't make the choice to invest. They didn't know if it was going to have a return on investment for them or for the students going through. That's just one example. I'm going to look at uh, the god of today's proceedings. One more? One more. Okay, I'm going to take three. This has to be, I'm going to borrow a line from my colleague, Phil Cowley. This has to be one sentence and end in a question mark. Okay, um, can I have uh, the gentleman at the front, gentleman there, and the gentleman at the back? Uh, Seema mentioned that we have the pieces of the jigsaw in our hand. I think she meant jigsaw puzzle, because jigsaw is the thing that takes things apart. So my question is, <laughs> how do we map the devolution goals with the aspiration and need for major thinking and investment in things like the green, et cetera, et cetera, which will need the whole country to be moving together. Your hands up, please. Thank you very much. It's Matthew Holhurst from, from The Economist. Um, Labour's planning policy would seem to be a really interesting example of where your electoral coalition, which is, is younger and more urban, effectively enables you to pull levers that the Conservative Party cannot. Are there any other examples you, you, that you would point to where the, the nature of the coalition that may bring you to power will enable you to do things that will boost Britain's productivity that the Conservative Party has been unable to do simply because of the, the, the nature of, of its electoral coalition? Great, and finally there was a hand at the, a couple of rows behind, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, uh, I just want to know, like, what you guys thought on the Tory government's leveling up agenda? Was it real? Was it just a PR stunt to fool everybody? Or did they actually something concrete there? And uh, what about the free zone? Uh, the, that's it. Thank you. Fantastic. Right. Um, should we start here and then go across? Yeah, I, I know time's time. I'll just probably come in on the first um, first question for this. Just on on devolution and how it's part of the jigsaw puzzle. If I did say uh, puzzle, um, look, there's what there's what uh, Nick said this morning that's very important, and that is it's devolution of political power as well as economic power, and. The Take Back Control Act that you know that we've we've uh, we we've, we've sort of used as the as the vehicle for some steps in this direction would also be around um, housing planning um, infrastructure um, even things like uh, childcare um, some of those soft, softer economic enablers which are economic enablers they are the things that either help they are both job creation and industries in their own rights but they all are also what enable others uh, to to go to work or to be trained it's an enabler even for enterprise, because a lot of women-led businesses have said to me that childcare holds them back and the lack of a childcare infrastructure. But having a way in which you've got some of those um, tools uh, devolved is going to be really important because the centre is not going to be able to deliver everything and local decisions have to be made locally. So I hope that alongside that, we'll see um, a much better way in which we join up some of the areas even that have got combined authorities now into um, stronger um, uh, parts of, stronger sub-regions with more controls and direction over their economy. Um, I, I, I'll just say as, um, uh, as well that um, uh, this is about um, making sure that there is enough scale to make some of the bigger decisions because the challenge of having just the centre and having just more local it misses out a sort of point of scale that's really important in the middle and how you're going to be able to then have efficiencies in how you invest and where you invest. But I'll make this final point as well. When you're talking about inward investment, this isn't just about people going through Westminster and into the rest of the country. One of the areas that we've lost out on has been links being built between regions and nations and somebody told me this very starkly in a conversation recently because European nations they are very regionally based in how they structure their economies as well and there was much stronger links between regions this isn't about Brexit but much stronger links between regions and our regions and the same has been true even of countries like India where I talked about you know investment they lost a lot of those links 
when the RDAs were taken away without a plan for how inward investment would still be supported. That wasn't about just the RDAs, it was about a plan. And the government didn't have one. They re retreated everything into the centre and made it a much more centralised economy, with the result that we've seen the divides grow um, uh, over the last 10 years. So the, the Conservative government of Rishi Sunak is obviously putting a lot less energy into levelling up than the Conservative government of Boris Johnson did. And um, although there have been some kind of interesting small moves towards further devolution, there's no real science about which decisions get taken at which levels because we've taken all of it centrally for so long. So I think there's going to have to be some trial and error in that. Um, uh, it, but, but we're starting from a place where more devolution is the only direction of travel because we are so highly, highly centralised. And it's going to involve talking to each other, not having adversarial relations between the centre and the localities and doing much more. You know, one talks about coordination. That means people talking to each other. Um, so uh, I'm glad that some government departments are now based in Darlington. You still can't make policy for Cornwall when you're sitting in Darlington. Um, so we've seen some small steps in the, in the right direction, but much, much further to go. Yeah, to take on, the, on that devolution point, I used to work in the Treasury. It was bonkers. There were like 400 civil servants spending £600 billion every year. Did we know how to spend that money? Well, no, we didn't. Like, you know, and it was ridiculous. I was there in my what, early to mid 20s, making those, like, helping to make those decisions rather. Actually, like, we don't know what we don't know. I think we're going to have to like trust. I think like Diane says, it is going to have to move down. Woods, we aren't making good decisions. One thing to say is when you go to Westminster, it's very easy to get from Westminster to like parliamentary constituencies. It's very hard to move between them by public transport. I would suggest because MPs in Westminster voted for transport links to make it easy to get back to their constituencies, but weren't really worried about traveling in between them, right? So devolving power helps to sort out uh, some of those problems. I'm not blaming Seaman, by the way, obviously, but like that is, I think, a problem we've had in this country for too long. We're one of the most economically centralized countries in the OECD because we are the most politically centralized. It just it has not worked. It's time to devolve and time to give it away. On the point about a political coalition, I think it's really interesting, right? Because actually we have a first-past-the-post system. So whilst Labour does have a coalition of renters, in the seats we need to win to get into government, like my own in Loughborough, for example, we've still got, I think, 65% of them are us are homeowners, right? Actually, all our renters are, are in London, and the same thing with kind of uh, an allegory with kind of the last election, where those divides don't help us. not a, a numbers game, it's a where is everyone distributed game. And actually, it was a really welcome and bold policy, you know, to kind of say, actually, no, we are going to build more houses. I think one of the problems with economic policy making over the past 13 years has been thinking about the electoral coalition and not about the stake in people's future. And so, look, I go out on the doorstep a lot, and people talk to me about about house building and they are not the nimbies of imagining you, know, you speak to someone they go look I know we need more houses I know my kids are gonna need more houses but I can't get a GP appointment the school is full the sewer is overflowing how do you expect more houses to be built right we're matching that with infrastructure is important and so people actually are not I think as cynical as the past 13 years of policy making has been right I think people are sitting there going actually we do need more and similarly as well. So I was really very, very pleased uh, to see that. And I'm very much looking forward to it. Look, I'm of a, a generation, like despite the grades, I'm still young, right? And it is hard for my friends to get on the housing ladder. It's hard for them to have kids, hard for them to move forward. Great nations look to their future. For the past decade, we've only looked to our past. It's time to move forward. Thank you. Brilliant. I think the only thing to thank, thank the panel.